<laughs> this synergizes with a lot of the stuff that um, was just presented about an hour ago. So I'm going to kind of uh, talk about a couple of things. And so this is a beginner's guide to image de-identification uh, data sharing for brain imaging data. So I'm going, normally I do things in Linux and normally I try to script as much as possible. Since this is supposed to be a beginner's guide, I am doing things on Windows <laughs> with programs that seem to be available on Linux, Mac, and Windows. And I am not using anything involving a command line script. So this should really be um, a relatively low entry comparatively to some of the things that um, people were talking about. Oops, wrong, wrong button. So unfortunately, I do not have any disclosures that give me extra money for doing research, um, although that would be great in the future. Um, so in one of the documents that um, I've had to prepare this year, there was sort of the who, what, where, when, why, and how uh, um, in order to kind of develop your de-identification policy. Um, and so, the first thing I wanted to do is de-identification. What does it entail and why? So I, I'm not going to talk about the European data standards, which are even kind of more complicated than, than in the US. So I'm going to focus mostly on kind of the HIPAA requirements. But essentially, every study I've ever been involved in, even if it's within my university, requires as much information to be removed as possible before I share it. Um, and so this has to be balanced, like we said, what is needed to allow investigators to conduct their research. So in very few cases do most collaborators need the actual patient names. One of the things that came up in our previous meeting was what type of data is shared. So within the brain imaging community, DICOM data, would, we would say, is um, much preferred for reasons I'll get into later, but NIFTY is also a very common format that has certain advantages in certain contexts that I'll get into. The other thing is also, what actually do the investigators need? So I've gone through things at my own university where when you actually, and I'll show you guys in a second, when I actually go to a, you know, a scan day, there's lots and lots and lots of images that are required, some of which are probably completely useless for downstream research. But if we're being good stewards of data de-identification, we would still have to review if we were going to share them. So if, I'm go if I have 10 minutes to spare, I'd much rather spend my time going through a T1 MP-Rage image as opposed to splitting that 10 minutes between localizer scans that I don't think anyone will ever use for anything reasonable. So one of the other considerations, and this also relates to what format the data is exported in, is how's the data gonna be disseminated? So even though HIPAA applies sort of in any of these contexts, we'll call it the downstream drama related to a data breach is significantly easier when it's shared with a data use agreement with a small group of collaborators, as opposed to put on a completely open FTP site somewhere in the universe in terms of, um, you know, what you'd want to provide. And one of the big pieces about this is if you're making the data completely available to the public at large, they really don't have a mechanism to communicate back with you and say, hey, I need this parameter, you forgot this, you didn't do this. And so in some cases you can release data in a mechanism that makes it useless for downstream analysis. And a good example is brought up um, in one of the first talks where they're talking about ASL imaging or perfusion imaging. If you strip out too many private tags or too much of the metadata that if you're not a domain expert may just look like random noise in the DICOM, you could make the data totally useless. Um, the other thing that tends to get ignored is how much time do you want to spend doing this? <laughs> how many sources is, this, is the data coming from? I think as, as was brought up, Research, if this is part, if these, particularly if these are clinical scans where hundreds or you know many, many different um, techs may be um, involved in scanning the patients, they can type things pretty much in any random DICOM field, which can make it much more challenging to standardize a de identification workflow. The other thing is, is there someone else who can look at the data after you've de identified it? Because I think, as we all know, reviewing stuff you did yourself you're very unlikely to catch anything. 
And like I said, I kind of repeating myself, what's the use case or need of the researchers? Um, you know, what are they going to use the data for? So um, there's already a, a, a brief talk about the, AC, the ACR and HIPAA guidelines. Some of the things that are probably interesting, though, is any age over 89 years old is actually needs to be removed, according to HIPAA guidelines. A lot of these things like email addresses, IP addresses, security numbers, you may not think would actually be in, in some of the data, but if these are clinical patients and somehow this stuff was pulled over when the scan was created, this stuff could show up. Also, this whole full face photos and comparable images, if you're taking a hot 3T MRI of someone's face, I think 15 years ago, it wasn't particularly easy to reconstruct what someone's face looked like now with Facebook and all the public data that's available of like, you know, what does Florian, who is Florian Noll, what's his face look like? You can actually Google that now and I'm sure, well, I know it's possible if you, you could match that to his MRI image. So the real challenge in the de-identification is where to look. So this is the where. So unfortunately, the answer is anywhere and everywhere. So the image itself can actually have PHI. So besides the face, um, these are x-rays, but there can be stuff either, you know, there could be a metal tag on someone, a dog tag, who knows, which obviously hopefully not a metal dog tag in an MRI, but if it was a CT image, there could be some piece of physical jewelry or whatever that may have a personal identifier. But for an X-ray, you know, they actually put on these little plates that may have, they, not as much anymore, but they used to actually have the patient ID on the X-ray prior to the exciting world of digital everything. And essentially, the DICOM metadata, which unless you're relatively sophisticated, um, can leak PHI, even if you're not aware it's even there. You know, most, most image browsers are focused on looking at the images, even though DICOM is available and you can usually click a button to, to go through the tags, it's not necessarily intuitive to everyone that you need to go through that. Another thing, the file name itself can contain PHI. So depending on how you export things, you may accidentally click a button that just names it based on the patient. So even if you're, if you're essentially not paying that much attention to the file names, but you're just paying attention to these other attributes, you can do it. And one of the veins of my existence is this, the, the concept of a date. So when I first started going through this, I thought it had to be an important date, like the person's birthday or when they were got a diagnosis. But now the standard just seemed to move towards any date, since no one can really tell, is this an important date? Can you link it to a birthday, et cetera, et cetera? Essentially, all dates need to be removed or time shifted or, or, or dealt with. The thing that's also interesting, there can also be embedded metadata that, it, you know, some of the DICOM tags can actually tell you the referring physician name. That's not your patient name, but, you know, if you have a rare disease and it, you know, you Google Johnston Bridget, you can kind of figure out what that person probably had by figuring out what they did it. And, you know, these are the things where you gain enough pieces of information and you can, you know, reverse identify. You also have the same thing where institution names are commonly burnt in as well, you know, things like that. So thanks to um, Dr. Clooney, who's also on, um, you know, one of the challenges with talking about image de-identification is you really can't share data with people to de-identify. <laughs> like I can't show you lots of patient data in order to even do a demo. So one of the questions is how do I even, you know, put together a presentation? So fortunately the MBIA has some, um, a, a collection of de-identified or pseudo PHI data. Um, you can also show pictures of monkeys, primates, anything that, you know, looks human-like. And finally, I have a scan from one of my friends who, uh, I, I got her name out of there, but I'm not too worried about her identity being disclosed. So in terms of the toolkit, a lot of this depends on what platform you're using. I tried to find some widgets that seem to have uh, represent both open source and also were installable on Linux, Windows, and Macs. For this one, I was using Wesis as just the thing I used to just open the images and just briefly look at them. I used to use Osiris when I was a Mac person exclusively, which a lot of people like. And um, in this presentation, I actually have, I tried to keep the reader for the pre-identified images different from the post-identified images. So I didn't get confused if I'm looking at the before or after. Although if you're not rushing through a presentation, you could probably just use one piece of re um, software. In terms of the toolkit, um, I actually am using de-identification software called DICOM Cleaner, um, which is open source, um, it's cross-platform, um, developed by Dr. Clooney. 
And there's a couple of novel features of this, which I'll um, go through in a minute. Um, and I'm also going to give a very quick um, version where I'm just showing you how the data could just be converted to nifty um, in, you know, in a drag and drop fashion using MRI cron or MRI cro by Dr. Rorden. Um, I'm not going to go into auto advanced topics like automated defacing. That's, um, I don't think that's a beginner's guide. Um, the other popular tool out there that's open source is something called the clinical trial, the clinical trial processor software. That's a Java application, but I would not consider that a beginner's tool because A, it's a lot, not that hard to install, but it's a lot harder to install. And it has way more parameters because it's way more powerful. Um, so then the question is why bother? So what are the costs of bad de-identification? So violating HIPAA is bad, I'll just leave it at that. Um, also, if you spend a lot of time de-identifying data, if you do it too much and get rid of too much metadata, you release, you spend a lot of effort and the data just can't be used. Like if you say you were you wanted to release your perfusion data to be a good citizen, but you removed every tag that you didn't completely understand, no one else can, pro I'm going on a limb and saying it's very likely that it wouldn't be able to be used for reconstruction if you don't actually have enough of the parameters of you know <laughs> how the data was required. The other thing also is this minimum necessary rule. What do you actually need to share in order to make the useful? And I think the biggest thing is very few people get famous de-identifying data. You know, so you know you have to make sure that you have the time and effort to actually do this right because you really don't want to rush through this because explaining to your IRB board why you accidentally released a couple of hundred people's names would be bad. Um, I don't want to do that. And I don't think any of us want to spend time doing that. So now I'm just going to switch over to WESIS, which is just a DICOM image browser. So I've, I've preloaded some random data. Some of this is from that um, NBIA data bundle. I also loaded an MRI data set from a friend of mine, as well as some monkeys or some chimpanzees that I'm pretty sure um, are not subject to HIPAA, at least currently. So a couple of the things I wanted to just highlight, obviously um, brain imaging and x-rays are not necessarily, um, this isn't the data most of us will be looking at, but what I wanted to highlight here is you can imagine someone with a deep brain stimulator or some other implanted device, which is potentially common, and it's possible you could read the serial number off the actual device itself. I've had discussions about that, but that's clearly a bad thing. You know, if so, you could actually, even though you wouldn't necessarily say there's burnt in PHI on this necessarily, if you, you know, if I play around with the contrast, it's I'm not saying in this case it's true, but it's possible for some of the devices, you may actually be able to read it, read some sort of registration number. Or since this is an X-ray or CT, the person might be wearing jewelry with their name written on it or something like that. That would be obvious. The other um, examples, um, you know, just sort of the more basic, oh, this one doesn't have a, um, a plate on it. But again, I haven't seen this as common, but you can also actually literally, these are little plates that are common, common part of the X-ray, but you know, you can actually have just either it's burnt in by some sort of physical device or sometimes the scanner actually just act, you know writes it on to the um, i think i deleted the ones where it was burnt in i was trying to um, strategize things but sometimes it's the the device itself will just write you know elizabeth young here's her birthday here's her hospital whatever and so this is actually why i'm using the dicom cleaner tool because it actually not only allows you to scan the metadata it allows you to um block out or black out a region of the images so now I'm going to switch to, let me switch to Aaron image. So one, the next question is, this is a, a DTI series with a T1, a localizer, T1 MP rate, some T2 data. So the, one of the questions is, do I just want to release everything in here? So based on the standard, I think that's been set, technically I'd have to go through the metadata in every one of these different scans. Since I don't think anyone's ever going to use these three localizers to do anything interesting, because would I really want to spend the effort to even, you know, manipulate those? And so one of the ones I things I wanted to pull out now is, is I just click this button. I'm looking at limited DICOM attributes. Okay, that's bad. Patient birth date. No, no doubt there that that's a bad thing to have. Um, here's the study. Here's the series. You know, I would look at this quickly and be like, okay, this stuff looks okay. But then this is where the um, smorgasbord comes in. There are, I don't know how many DICOM tags, but there's lots and lots and lots of them. Some of them are um, public tags, which means 
there is some kind of key value pair and I should have some idea what series time means. It's probably a time. Whereas there's also things that are completely private tags. And so the private tags are used by vendors and they have all sorts of properties related to image reconstruction beyond my level of expertise. But sometimes if you nerf them because you don't know what they are, you make the data useless. But even getting past the person's name, which you know, on the first click I was able to find, now I see, oh, that's probably not good. If this was populated, which it's not, that would be bad. Another thing is the station name or the scanner. So in most cases, I would argue, you wanna have some idea of where, if you have a, a site that has 50 different patients and 50 different scanners, you probably wanna know that for some analyses as opposed to one site with two scanners. What if you know, all of your healthy controls were scanned on you know, 3T Siemens and all of your um, you know, depressed patients were scanned on, I don't know, some a different you know, Phillips or something like that. You probably wanna know that before you're saying people with depression look different than people with controls because the other interpretation is people scanned on different scanners look different. Um, but again, now there's a patient name tag, you know, like as you go through this, you know, these are some of the more common tags. Now there's a private tag that has binary data. Is it really binary data? I don't speak binary, but you know, it's possible there's some hidden PHI lurking in there. I think a lot of this goes down to though, having a standard operating procedure and saying, I did this, this is where I looked at, this is how I reviewed it. I'm kind of convinced, um, and people can put in the chat if they disagree with me, that no matter how much time and effort you put into it, there's always things you don't know. I think in one presentation, someone put a field like Kanji patient name or something like that. So there was like a patient's name written in a language I don't understand that probably if I spoke, you know, if I knew that language, I would have been like, oh, that's a, that's, <laughs> I shouldn't have let that slip through. But I think as long as you kind of are following like an SOP, you kind of save yourself. So again, for this part of the demo, all I wanted to show you is I just opened up some images and we looked at them, you know? And like I said, the first thing of the due diligence is actually seeing. So in my case, I'm going through my, M, my, my T1s. I actually don't see any burnt in image. I don't see any burnt in text. So that would probably be the first thing I want to do. And that would actually affect what the downstream tool I would want to use for the next phase. So in this case, though, I'm going to use um, Dr. Clooney's handy dandy DICOM cleaner because it's the only thing I've found that's kind of GUI driven and also allows you to not only block out um, the, meta, the common metadata fields, it will also allow you to nerf some of the uh, text, sorry, some of the burnt end stuff. So this is quite easy to use. I import a scan, I go to local data, DID data, I hit open, do, do, do. the scan's been imported. I can double click on it. I can either, um, I was saying I could either do the entire, all the series, or if I wanted to save myself a little trouble, I could do them one by one. So in this case, I want the T1 MP rage. Important thing to note down here, I can change the patient's name. It will do it for me on the fly. The only thing is it, this isn't scriptable in the sense that I can say Aaron Preuss is human test one, you know, Abby Preuss is human test two. So this is still a manual process, but it's actually amazingly quick. So I click a couple of the boxes here that are described on Dr. Clooney's website, including remove all unreplaced identities, remove the institution identifier, add contributing equipment. I could remove descriptions if I wanted. And this also matters. I know they were just talking about um, some of the novel scans for looking at neuromelanin, it could be possible they say, you know, Emory underscore neuromelanin protocol. If I've decided that I shouldn't let my university name be shared, but the series itself was called, you know, Gutman's Lab, which I don't do, but you know, Emory neuromelanin protocol, there's another place where you could inadvertently release things. So I can remove series description. So the first thing I do is I just hit clean. It worked, it ran really quickly. So I haven't exported anything yet, but I now have a clean data set in terms of the metadata tags. I can now do blackout. So this is, fortunately, this tool is actually relatively user-friendly and I'm gonna to get to a part of the image where there's actually something to look at. Um, so I'm going to just pretend 
um, that I've decided this part of the image is bad. So fortunately, the square gets applied to every next um, slice in that series, because you can imagine drawing 176 boxes would go over badly. So I can hit apply and save. Um, it's running in the background. You can see, I don't know if you can read it, but my screen is, the blackout is now complete. I also want to save, I'll do the T2 axial flare. I'm going to hit clean, boom. Now I'm going to do blackout. So now this will actually, since I did two things, I should have done this um, slightly differently. Let it go. Okay, let me do it here too. Account. So you can see now this is a different orientation. This is a different image. So I also have to do that blackout for the second image. So again, it's not, it's actually pretty easy to do. So now it's applying it all 128 images there. Do, 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 do. Um, one other thing is it will do time shifting or it will replace dates. I actually, because I've rebooted my computer four times today, thanks to Zoom, I had unchecked the data birth box, even though I had Zoomed it before. So let's actually see what happens in this case. So now all I'm going to do is I'm going to export this data to um, ooh, cool. So I could load this into Wesis, but just to just so I don't get confused about the before and after, I'm just using a, a, another um, um, DICOM tool. So I just ah, sorry, I just a micro DICOM. Sorry, you guys can see. What else is on my gaming computer? Um, so all on this is I'm just going to do open DICOM directory, live demo. I'm going to click on this DICOM directory. Um, so you can see here, oop, I'll give you a hint. The date at the scan was not January 1st, 2000. So it did a good job of removing the date. This is where we're talking about doing that secondary review. I'm not going to kind of skim through this and see if I removed anything. As you notice, and I even knew this was going to happen, I did not remove the study description. I didn't click that box. So it still says Yerkes. I happen to know Yerkes is where um, one of my friends work. So I would probably, depending on what the, um, what the protocol is or what I need to remove, I would probably go back and you know, run, the, run the de-identification again. Um, but you know, kind of going through this, I you know, I'm going to just pretend I don't see anything that's troubling. Um, this date, even here's a date time that's put in by the DICOM cleaner. So that's probably an okay date to have. Keep scanning, keep scanning, keep scanning. Like I said, the only thing that's um, arguably problematic still is this, this procedure in the series description, which I could probably, you know, I would just have to run the tool again. Um, the thing I wanted to show you though is you see how it, it did though, however, black out the box where I said, you know, there's probably, you know, I need to get rid of this. In most MRI images, it seems to be relatively uncommon to have it burnt in for a T1 or something like that. Usually it's in the upper left corner or upper right hand corner though. And, you know, like I said, this is the only GUI based tool that I've come across that allows you to do this sort of thing. So I'm just gonna close MRI.com just as a proof of principle. I'm going to just do one more, um, data set real quick. I'm going to de-identify, oh, that was quick. Um, this is going to be a chimpanzee. I'm, or yeah, a chimp. Um, you can see here, this one has a DTI scan. In fact, it is a DTI scan. So there's thousands of images. That's one of the advantages of using Nifty. It usually produces one file per series. DICOM produces lots and lots of files. If you ever try to FTP your entire image repository with several million um, DICOM files in it, you'll know some of the pain of transferring lots and lots of small files. But let me just put that in the background. Um, let it 
kind of chunk through this little fortunately this is a new fast computer which is why i can play games on it and it will be done <laughs> should be done in a minute um oh, there it is it's in the background yeah this will be done in a minute um actually in, in parallel um we were mentioning the process of just i'm going for whatever reason i know all we need is the die um nifty's fine they don't care about the DICOM parameters for whatever reason. They just want the T1s. And if I dump it into a um, nifty file, you know, that's fine. So fortunately, the, these are well-tested tools. They've been around, I mean, I think Chris Warden wrote DICOM to NII 20 years ago. I mean, I remember using it when I was in graduate school. And, so in this case, all I'm going to do is I'm just, oh, actually, I already have it open. Um, well, I'll open it again anyway. So I opened up this, oops, my mouse is being goofy, drag and drop DICOM to Nifty Converter. You can see this is the April 2010 version. I think there's another version that actually puts some more metadata, but um, on Windows, I, I, I'm happy with what I get. So all I'm going to do in this case I'm going to take Aaron, same scan I just showed you. I'm going to just check a couple of options real quick. Acquisition date, input, blah, 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 acquisition series. Probably don't want to do that. Um, and then the question is, where do I want to save it? I'll put it on the space I just set up. I'm going to make a new folder, live demo output. I'll spell it correctly. I'm going to hit OK, hit OK. And then this is easy. It would be difficult to be much easier than that. Again, the trade off is, and I'll show you guys in a second, I've just thrown out a lot of metadata that probably a third of the researchers who, are, who may be listening in probably need to do some of their image reconstruction. So in this case, though, the verification of, you know, not making of um, looking for PHI is easy. So I'm using MRI cron, which is DICOM to NII's um, cousin, they're written by the same author. All I need to do is I'm gonna go to the nifty output. Oop. These are the files that were just generated. I can go through them all. In this case, I'm just gonna look for the um, T1 image. I open it. I am guaranteed there is no PHI other than her face. Um, I can't tell what she looks like from her face. Actually, it's this nightmare over here if you want to see what it looks like in 3D. Although, like I said, that's kind of an advanced class of, um, you know, if we actually need to do defacing, you probably need to do some sort of scripting to do this efficiently, which I think is a much harder, um, it's a different course. Um, so let me just try to um, export one more scan. Doot, doot, doot. So now I'm going to go back to Agatha Preuss which is a, a very friendly chimp at Yerkes or was, I don't know, this data is old. So now again, I'm not gonna export everything. I'm gonna purge everything over here. So it's, it, I'm starting again, so we don't get confused. Thank God for NVMe drives. Um, if you're using DICOM files, fast IO is never, never gonna hurt. Um, Oh, sorry, it's just purging. Oh, that's getting kind of boring. Okay, this is taking longer than I wanted. Any questions while I let this uh, kind of clean itself up? Although I don't know how I can see the, sh the chat window, if there is a chat window. So I guess one question is, um, at the beginning, you kind of showed your process for like how you go through the images and the metadata fields. Mm -hmm. So do you do this for every single study that you do? Um, or do you kind of do it for like one test case and then rerun the sequence over and over again? Do you have that type of confidence? Um, 
I do not have that type of confidence. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, um, this TCIA, in my opinion, is the gold standard for this workflow. Like they, they, I think they do it the best. They have very smart people who have written a lot of the de-identification software and their standard is still to have a human go through every piece of DICOM attribute and every, I think now they're not looking at every picture, they're looking at mosaics and stuff like that, but they still have eyeballs on it. Since I'm trying to show command, um, non-command line or non-scripting tools, I like normally I'd probably write a little, there's little apps you can write that will kind of turn it into a web page. So you can like for free surfer, they do this all the time. You can look at, you know, all of the images in one snapshot, hit next, 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 next. The same thing with the DICOM attributes. There's really no reason to look at every DICOM attribute. There's a reason to look at every unique DICOM attribute. So one of the nice things that the CTP does, the clinical trial processing software does, is you point it at a directory it sniffs every pair, every key value pair in the input data set. Um, again, I haven't used it in a couple of years, fortunately, because I've been using the data, not generating it. But um, you then, instead of having to look at a lot of just repeat garbage, you know, you're just essentially looking at every unique key value pair. And again, if you want to be even more sophisticated, you could detect things that are floats and ints and only look at things that look like dates and look like strings. Because I'm actually working on similar projects for um, whole slide imaging, which is an even bigger disaster in terms of data sharing. So the short answer is I would nominally look at everything. Most of the stuff I've been doing is related to the scans are from clinical stuff. So it's no one's using the same scanner, no one's using the same protocol, and the techs are all over the place. So my level of mistrust is extremely high, and my desire to have awkward conversations with the IRB about why I released some depressed patient scan is really low. So um, I would defer to having to look at everything. The flip side, though, is if I want to release 5,000 scans, I can't imagine hiring anyone who would not quit if I said that was their job for the next six months. So I don't have a perfect answer, unfortunately. Um, let me just, so this loaded, it just, like I said, because there's so many scans in here, it took a little longer. Again, it's easy. I hit clean. Actually, I'm going to run it again. I'm going to add the date of birth. I'm going to get rid of descriptions, clinical trial outputs, series descriptions, um acquisition protocol name device identifiers <laughs> i'm gonna go i'm gonna go to the very conservative side patient characteristics if you're over 85 years old you're phi now so even if patient's ages is irrelevant or is okay to include most of the time it's not in some context so now i'm clicking all the bells and whistles i'm going to clean it again i'm going to black it out i hope oh wait sorry do it over here There you go. Um, fortunately, I don't need to black out nothing. Um, I'm going to draw my little square over here. I'm going to hit apply and save. Bada bing, bada boom. I wait not very many seconds. I would export it again, live demo. Hit OK. It's now exported. I go to my handy. I don't mind this piece of software that much. Um, I'm just going to open a DICOM directory. But like I said, even if you're doing this manually, this isn't a crazy amount of work. If you have hundred, hundred, small hundreds of scans, like this is a tractable problem. It's when you have 12,000 scans, you know, if like I wanted to take every brain tumor that Emory ever had, it's 3000 scans from God knows how many scanners. That's really where it becomes a bit of a nightmare. So now you can see, um, did I click the right, maybe I didn't click the right button to get rid of the scan name um, in this case, but I am going to turn on the, oh, here, I'm sorry. I'm like looking for the DICOM data. So now I can go through this again and just, you know, it looks requested procedure description. Oh, I don't, so this is probably, so I'm not sure if I am not clicking one of the boxes or, 
since this is primate data and they do things probably a little bit differently than a human scans, I don't know if this is a tag that the DICOM cleaner should have removed and didn't, or this is just some random weird tag that was just added at our scanner that I would have to um, remove using another process. Actually, David, I was watching what you were doing and uh, you, you hadn't uh, purged the previous um, uh, edition of this and you actually inadvertently purged the monkey. And so you're uh, re reconverting the um, uh, the woman's image and uh, ah. you you did it into place with the other uh, ones. And, and so I think you ended up with, if you expand the study there, you'll probably see two different series. No, nope. uh, well, but anyway, um, the, monkey anyway had, the monkey has long been purged. Yeah, so the, the short answer is I did something stupid because I'm rushing to do this as a live demo. But this is again, like, you know, that I would not, keep clicking different options and doing this. You'd really want to just set up, you know, these are the things that I need to remove. Like I said, Dave, Dr. Clooney's software is pretty robust. So um, yeah, I, I, I would say um, to your point of when you have hundreds of thousands of scans, um, you know, this tool is only intended for, you know, um, people doing this sporadically and, and doing one or two scans. If you are going to do this on a large scale, um, CTP can be configured to remove burned ND identification if you already know where it is. It can be scripted to recognize certain patterns of tags to identify, for example, ultrasound images of a certain type and size. Yeah. The other thing I would say is that there are far more advanced tools, for example, Google's de identification service provided by the Google Healthcare API um, does uh, optical character recognition on the images, finds text, and then feeds that text through its NLP. So it goes through their data loss prevention program, which can be configured to recognize names and addresses and numbers and selectively retain uh, things, for example, measurements, but get rid of all of the PHI or remove all text that's burned in if you want. Uh, and furthermore, you can apply that same NLP to the text uh, fields in the DICOM header. So if someone has typed a name or address or birth date or something into, for example, study description, it will find it and selectively remove it. So there's a whole class of new generation tools um, that are commercially available that, um, and some are, are freely available that, that do a, a much more uh, thorough job of this on a very large scale. But I concur with your earlier statement that 100% um, human QC is, is the safest thing for the most conservative uh, amongst us. Yeah, and, and to, to David's point, you know, I program and script all the time. I would never, I would use the CTP to do this. But if you're trying to reach out to, you know, get data from a small center, you can't see their stuff because it has PHI in it. So it's very hard to troubleshoot on their end in a lot of cases, because, you know, they're technically not supposed to share it with you and you screen share and stuff like that. So, you know, it's this, it's this balance between like the technical expertise required to do it with CTP or one of the other things. Like I said, CTP is not that hard, but you know, configuring scripts, editing XML documents, et cetera, et cetera, it's not a beginner's guide to image <laughs> de-identification. <laughs> um, I would say it's a fairly, you know, it, it's not that hard, but it's definitely, definitely not something I don't think a beginner would, uh, <laughs> would wanna do. We also have a question for the chat from the chat. Um, so Marcus Avente says, uh, thanks for the really interesting talk. Can you comment on distributed learning algorithms that are a big area of research these days, such as private federated learning where samples are never shared directly? These seem like promising, but completely different solution to the privacy problem. Yeah, so I have some collaborators and they're using bids in some cases that format we were talking about to do some of that. So there it's actually an interesting paradigm i mean so the idea i'm being very general but essentially you have you can run it locally or you have some and we'll just say you have a computer whether or not it's in the cloud or running locally on your machine um, but you know you have so the only thing that can see the bits of your image is essentially either your own private cloud or um, your own local machine so it has access to all of the, the scary PHI that you're not allowed to share. Now, I cannot explain completely 
how the mo like the uh, the model passes bits from my model to the one running at Harvard and the one running at Stanford and the run running where David is. But essentially, instead of me running my model and then it doing a great job on my data, and then I give it to you, and then it d does a terrible job on your data, and then maybe it does a slightly better job after you retrain it. And you know, you kind of keep passing on the model and just training them sequentially. There is a mechanism with, there's ways where the data can be transformed into some other space that has similar math <laughs> to the raw bits. So you can do certain common operations on it without actually letting the, the shared data know, know exactly what it's looking at. Um, so in that case, essentially, everyone is running their own probably GPU and it's you know building some sort of machine learning model using only the local data. But then you, and almost all all of the more recent like convolutional networks or whatever, you know, it's you, you keep training and training and training. So you have cycle, cycle, cycle. So instead of waiting to cycle 30 saying, okay, I did a good job on my stuff, I'm gonna pass it off. Basically as it's training on each cycle, the we'll call them common weights or common properties that seem to be working in one center or immediately that knowledge is immediately shared somehow with your center. So essentially you're co-training um, in parallel or really at the same time, as opposed to doing it much, much later, which has a, you know, there's a lot of um, disadvantages. But again, in this case, they never see the raw imaging data and we can get, but then this gets into the things where I've seen papers now where they can look at the weights of some model that's been published and figure out if your x-ray happened to be used for, you know, I had an x-ray and I can feed it into the model and it can still figure out that I was used to train the model. And, you know, I mean, I think this is sort of the, the cutting edge of how much does the computer know and what can you figure out if you try hard enough. Honestly, I'm convinced every all of my information is already on the dark web. So, <laughs> uh, um, you know, I don't have a good answer. But again, that's sort of the next this federated learning. I think is 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 powerful. I think the problem is it's again not a beginner's thing. Even get, I mean, I'm pretty good at this stuff. And even me getting an AWS container working half the time can be days of me smashing my head against my computer. So, you know, these are not um, novice tasks yet. I think year, two, three, I don't know. The stuff keeps getting easier. So um, I think that will eventually be the way stuff's run at like academic scale where, you know, they want to be able to pull anything from our packs and no one can manually go through and de-identify 10,000 images for free. <laughs> cool. Um, so, oh, there's one other question. Uh, Moritz Fabian. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. So I have uh, a question to you, David. So um, I was listening to your very interesting talk and also the you share the program, which I uh, will investigate uh, tomorrow, actually. But uh, there are some people um, that say that the built-in scanner functions, so some, so especially as MRI scanners have built-in anonymization functions, right? Did you have any time or did you put an effort in investigating or comparing these two, for example, your Daikon Cleaner tool? In almost every case, so short answer is no. In almost all cases that I've been involved in, I have almost nothing to do with the acquisition of the imaging. You know, I go, I write an IRB. So we're actually doing this at Emory. So I wanted to get every person who's been seen in neurology that had a T1 image for anything, as long as they're part of one of our research protocols. Some of the stuff was a decade ago. Some of the stuff was two years ago. So, and it's on, I don't know how many MRIs we have at our university, but it's more than none. You know, it's probably 10 or 12 or 15 and they all have different scanner versions and whatever. So I basically don't, have act like I think one of the presentations was on the um, the Parkinson's disease where they were setting up their own series and their own protocol and stuff like that. You could build that stuff in, but if you're sort of um, a uh, scavenger that I am, where I'm just trying to get data that's already been collected for free for some other purpose and reuse it for research, 
um, I don't have access to, you know, that's not really viable for, for, for most things I'd be interested in or not interested in, but, you know, have access to, I think, probably a better way to put it. Yeah, so um, just uh, um, for the better understanding, I was referring to, so there are these acquisition functions, but there's some, uh, also some vendors offer programs um, that are built in in the acquisition, but you did not do this um, because you um, all, all the time got um, the data from different sites, right? Yes, the other thing is, even if, so even with DICOM Cleaner or any of the tools, everything removes, if you say these are the fields that I know are verboten, please remove them. There's still the ability for the operator of the scanner to add, I, I remember this, this was like a decade ago, but there's like some DICOM tag related to whether or not the person needed a wheelchair to come to the MRI. And the scanner tech wrote in like, Mrs. Smith needed a wheelchair for help. I didn't even know that was a tag and I didn't even know to look there. And I doubt the anonymization software would have picked that up either. So I think still having a human pair of eyes is unfortunately um, required, even though I don't wanna be those eyes. <laughs> David, are you familiar more? I mean, you'd know more about this than I ever will about built-in anonymization from the scanner itself um yeah i, I think um the problem with those is that uh it's we are constantly upgrading the list of uh attributes to remove uh, to de-identify and we we have a list of those in the dicom standards in part 15 of dicom uh, section eight dot one and um people who write the identification software uh, for a living um maintain their software to make sure it, it is always removing the latest tags uh, whereas MR scanners are, are relatively infrequently upgraded. And so I would be very, very surprised if the uh, de-identification software in the scanners was was up to date or as thoroughly tested. I dare say it probably does a, a, a reasonable superficial job of de-identification. Um, and, and I may be uh, uh, not being charitable enough, but um, I, 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 I don't think they're used that much. I think they're helpful for, uh, you know, for example, a physicist who's, who's driving the MR themselves and playing around with developing a pulse sequence or something like that, and they're using um, a real person in the scanner as opposed to a phantom. But I'm not sure I would trust them as much as I would uh, the professional de-identification tools. Also, even in a PAX or a workstation or a piece of viewing software, many of them have de-identification functions. Uh, but again, I'm not sure that they're really as thorough as what might be done uh, by people who specialize in this field and, and use dedicated software. In clinical trials, for example, it was routine for us to receive information that had been de-identified at the site and they had, you know, the patient's name wasn't there in the patient name field, I'll grant you that. Um, but uh, we still ran it through a second round of de-identification to remove more and, and be more diligent. And we frequently found stuff. And I think that's been TCIA's experience as well. Uh, most of what they get from their sites or from the data coordinating centers um, are provisionally de-identified and they run CTP scripts uh, at those sites, uh, uh, but they still do a second round, if not a third round of de-identification at, CT at uh, TCIA to make sure. It's this catch-22, essentially. So in IRB, you're not supposed to release data unless it's been de-identified, but it's hard to do. So most people who don't do this for a living, you know, do a fairly good job. They send you the data, and then on the secondary review, you go, ups, that shouldn't be there. Technically, you have to delete it immediately from your system and then have them resubmit it, unless you have a, a, a fair use agreement. A, Business associate agreement. Yeah, a bit. Yeah, a BAA with them and stuff like that. So it's like this. It's this catch twenty two. Even in this case, it's like you're giving a talk on image identification. I can't actually share with you any real data because <laughs> then I'm in breach of of our IRB. So. Um, 
it's uh, it, 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 it's it's just complicated. Um, and I can almost guarantee that it, stuff will bleed through if um, a good pair of eyes aren't on it. And some people would find it. I mean, there's research papers who spend their time. Their job is just see if I can re-identify public data, right? I mean, they have an incentive to try to do it, not even for nefarious purposes, but to get a cool paper that, you know, Florian can put in his talk about <laughs> detecting faces and stuff. <laughs> But, but I think the, the bottom line is if you have any doubt about the tool you're using, um, the best thing to do is test it. And so most MR scanners can uh, accept uh, DACOM images from outside. So, uh, you know, send it some test images that are designed to stress the tool, such as the ones on TCIA, which were developed for that purpose, run them through the tool in the MR, and then do a comparison of before and after uh, DICOM dumps and, and make your own assessment of, of how... Um, uh, well, the tool has performed. We're actually in the process of trying to establish uh, sort of metrics, if you like, for the quality of de-identification, which, as you can imagine, is, is a difficult process. Uh, but uh, uh, even just looking at them informally on a small scale should give you some insight into whether your tool is performing thoroughly uh, or not. Well, yeah. And that's why I tried to separate, have like one to one the before tool and one the after tool. Because I mean, I even screwed it up where I didn't purge the data appropriately. So I was viewing an old version, you know, essentially a slightly different version with the same name where I had run a slightly different process just because the caching essentially, or I you know, clicked the wrong button. So, um, you know, I'm not, again, I'm not saying this is, it's, it's not an impossible process. It's just, you know, you, you need to be meticulous and you need to have an SOP. And I mean, in my mind, I mean, David, you may have a better sense of like what happens if you accidentally breach HIPAA, but I feel like if you have an SOP, you said these are the tools I use and these are the processes we've been through. It's bad, but it's not colossally bad <laughs> as opposed to. Just oh, it depends bad. on what you are. If you're a covered entity in the United States, it's colossally bad because that triggers a breach notification to OCR. But um, in, in Europe, it triggers GDPR provisions, but... Uh, uh, if you're not a covered entity, it's just, you know, ethically bad, in which case, um, uh, you know, you just want to be doing a better job. Um, but you're right. M mistakes happen. Uh, and there's no question mistakes happen. You just have to be as diligent as you can within reason. Well, I hate to uh, cut off any further discussion, but we are about 13 minutes past our end time now. Oh. So um, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Goodman again for a um, very nice talk on how to do the de de identification and uh, thank you all for attending. Awesome. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Cheers. Thanks.